Hey, what's up everybody? Chad Kalik here, and welcome back to the In a Crowded Room podcast for a very impromptu episode. If my uh, voice sounds a little strained right now, it is because I have been singing all afternoon, which is good. Uh, when I normally record and sing all afternoon, this happens, so uh, nothing bad. This is actually par for course. And if I, this is actually par for course. Out of my voice is sounding this normal after hours of singing that I'm doing okay. But I've been researching uh, some more things involved with Harbingers. And my God, guys, this story is just so incredibly fucking dark, man. Uh, I can tell you guys this, and I mean it. Uh, Harbingers is by far, by far, the darkest film that I've ever made. And that's saying a lot when you (laughs) stop and consider that American Ghost Hunter didn't have like an ounce of brevity to it. I mean, it was... American Ghost Hunter was a very dark documentary. Uh, This is dark in a different way, though. This is dark in an evil, demonic, churchy type of way, if that makes sense. It's kind of like an Exorcist 3 type of way. Um, Now, don't start guessing, because if you think that you know what it's all about, trust me, uh... It's it's definitely, like most of my films, uh, there is a twist to all of this stuff. Um, and, when, and when you're watching the films, when they're all done and that twist comes, trust me, you will know it. Um, but the reason I wanted to record this is because, specifically, I was doing some research, like I said, on this subject matter with... Harbingers, and I once again came across this demonic name, Raum, R-A-U-M. And this name has a long history with my family and I and uh, reoccurring cases um, that I've been on. And it reminded me of... A case for paranormal state that you guys really didn't get to see. You only saw a few minutes of it because we cut out to go to uh, Laura. I am six. We were actually, we started on a different demonic case in, I believe it was in Kentucky. And we ended up driving to Laura Mooney's in Illinois. Very long drive, Um, but we were on a case. If you remember that episode, um, you saw little bits and pieces of it, but guys, there is so much about that entire one day that we were there. Uh, Actually, it was two mornings. It was a, or an evening, and yes, then a morning the whole day, and the following morning we were there before we left for Laura Mooney's, but I am telling you, had we stuck around and finished that case, I honestly believe that case would have been (laughs) leagues beyond even uh, I am six because the amount of bizarre things that were going on really freaked me out. I mean... And I'm not, I'm just not a big get scared guy at these cases. Just because of my childhood and growing up in that house in Persia and what I experienced there, what I experienced with my own mother, uh, I just don't, I'm just not one. I mean, I get creeped out and I get, I guess at times you can get, um, you know, startled, but not a whole lot of fear. But I had a a massive growing sense of fear 
on that case. Uh, let me give you some context here because you guys only saw like the cliff notes of the cliff notes. And a lot of that was because Annie didn't know what to do with everything that was going on in this short time. And I'll explain why in a second. But when my parents had the investigators uh, from Nesper, uh, um, Mr. Jackson and his team that came and they investigated my house in Persia. Uh, now, they later... Lorraine met with me, as you guys saw in American Ghost Hunter, and later told me that those guys were affiliated with Nesper as students, but they did not give them, um, you know, the right to carry their name, per se, and to act on their behalf. But regardless, uh, they were training under the Warrens, and they had a ton of notes. By the way, it is... Man, it is freaky out right now. Uh, very late here. It is raining uh, in L.A. Uh, branches are beating against the windows. Yeah, God, it's spooky right now. I'm telling you, man, the deeper and deeper I get into Harbingers, it is just... Uh, anyways, you know, one of the names that they consistently came up with um, was this, this name, Raum. R-A-U-M. And there is a photo that I wish I could find. I scoured my house uh, back in Persia for it, the garage. My dad, he tried to find it as well, and he couldn't. Uh, there was a photo with what literally looked like a demon head, like, uh, like horns, like all of it right outside the window behind his recliner in our house in Persia. The problem is, his recliner was on the second floor. So right outside the, that window where it was seen was like a 20-foot drop. Uh, so, of course, it couldn't be anybody. It had to be something there. And admittedly, as a 12-year-old, uh, I mean, I know back then they didn't have Photoshop, but I didn't know enough about cameras or artifacts or anything like that to study that picture and try to figure out what that was. It could have been something natural. I don't know. It did not look like it. Um, but I remember, gosh, Vic, this guy, Vic, his name was Vic. He, you know, brought up the name Realm and it was being, uh, spoken, uh, he mentioned that my my mother had spoken it. No, 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 that's not true. It was on a recording that a EVP, and the name was spoken on this EVP, and um, that was the first time I heard Realm. And he told me back then he was like, "Oh yeah, Realm is really freaky. It's scary if that's who's doing this because you know Realm you know controls like thirty legions, and Realm is the the Earl of Hell, supposedly. Now, it's very Catholic. I mean, if you get into the whole legions and all that stuff, obviously. Um, I was just freaked out as a kid, but yeah. Uh, and he stated specifically that, you know, Realm was the, the demon of deceit. And what I thought was really interesting is he said that Realm often appears um, like a crow, like uh, in human form, and then also like a crow, like literally like the bird, like the crow, but then also a form that's kind of like a mixture, like a human man's body with a crow head, and that sometimes it also appears uh, like a crow's head, but it has horns. And um, and I found descriptions of both, uh, looking it up, and I remember it just really freaked me out, especially, you know, the crow part, because the one thing that was crazy prevalent at our house in Persia is there was crows everywhere, and specifically 
around our house. Like, I realize there's crows everywhere, period, right? But for some reason, at our house, uh, there was just an ungodly amount of crows all the time. All the time, you know. Um, when I showed up to that case in Kentucky, I'm bouncing ahead here now, I was pretty deep in my research for American Ghost Hunter. Now, remember, when we made American Ghost Hunter, my mother was not even on the list of people to interview. Uh, in fact, I didn't want to interview her. I had no idea anything was going on with her. Uh, that was very real, as you guys saw in the American Ghost Hunter documentary. I didn't know anything was going on with her. I was told uh, when they moved, all this stuff went away. They went and, and met with uh, some priests, and they were blessed, and everything was fine. And I know, in retrospect, that, that they weren't trying to, you know, at least my father wasn't trying to lie to me to trick me. He just wanted me to get on with my life. He didn't want me to be strapped, you know, to to all that evil shit back there. Um, but, like I said, we had no intention of interviewing, you know, my mother at all. Um, so, a lot of the research that I was doing uh, for American Ghost Hunter was really about other cases and the area. And I remember on those cases... Um, a couple other haunting, hauntings in the area, there was, um, you know, this realm uh, came up on a, co a couple different occasions. Uh, this was also the first time that I was um, looking into Anna Eklund and that case. And, I mean, I was just scratching the door on demonic case after demonic case after demonic case. Uh, I was completely enveloped in that world. And what you don't know, and, and you know, if you can hear these, this is freaking me out, these branches scratching against the windows here. Jesus, that's creepy. If you can hear that, guys, I'll try to add a compressor here and get that out of the mix. But, you know, the first time I you know talked with Lorraine about demonic cases she was like just understand there's no such thing as a bystander if you say you want to go and be a part of a demonic case if you look at it it's going to look at you and when it looks at you it's going to remember you forever for eternity uh, there will be no escape it will know you at that point and you will come face to face with it at different points throughout your life and if your faith is strong you'll be fine but if it's not if it's wavering there's going to be a price to pay. And I remember thinking, God, this is a heavy conversation, man. And uh, so right before I went to this case in Kentucky, that's when the number 18 started appearing uh, nonstop. And uh, if you watch the short film, AGH, The Missing Element, it kind of goes over how I first started noticing it. And actually, the first time I noticed it was when I had stopped to fill my gas tank and I left uh, the gas hose in my vehicle, uh, just filling as I went inside and went to the bathroom, which is a thing you do in the Midwest when it's cold. You just put the, you know, the gas pump in, uh, you know, pull the handle down, lock it up, and just let it run and fill up until, you know, you get back out. So I went inside, went to the bathroom, came out, uh, you know, paid for my gas and my re my uh, change was $18.18. And, .18. and I, was, I remember just thinking, oh, that's kind of interesting. Wow, $18.18, .18, exactly. I just randomly let it run. And uh, there was a number of other things that happened after that. But this number just started appearing everywhere and important dates of things like there was just so many things that it was just appearing and i noticed it when they got my ticket uh to fly out to that kentucky case um i was in seat 18 which the guy that booked the ticket didn't even 
she didn't, she did not even know me, didn't know anything that was going on with me in regards to the number 18. Uh, I remember the gate that I was at was, uh, or the gate that I landed at and got off was like 18C. Um, it was funny when we were on Laura's case, it was adding up there like crazy. Like Sergi and I were like almost to the point of laughing where it's like, Jesus, everything is 18. Like, I'm not going to say the numbers, but Laura's Laura's address to her house, it was four numbers. You add them up, they're 18. You know, he was like, how many people are on the cast and crew right now? Like, add everybody up. And I'm like, oh, dude, don't even tell me. And he's like, do it. I'm like, oh, my God, 18. I mean, it just came up everywhere. And then I started digging into that number. And Ryan was way ahead of me. He was. He already knew what it could represent. Um, but this was a thing in my life that kept happening with this 18. So when I landed in Kentucky, the thing that, again, you just don't know about demonic cases, and I can never explain this to you guys unless you were there and you were a part of them. Like, I can always tell you when it's a demonic case because nothing is right. Everything, like everything, just feels off. Nothing works right. Nothing happens like it should. Nothing is easy. Uh, personalities are weird. Yeah, it's just, it affects everyone and everything. And I think that one of the most mistaken, I can't tell you how many cases that I've been to where people think that it's a demonic case, and it's not. It's just, it's just negative energy. It's some kind of negative haunting or or it's a poltergeist and somebody has epilepsy and and uh, it's not demonic. You, you can really tell demonic cases. There is a darkness that you walk into, um, but beyond that, there is a weirdness. Like things aren't working the way they should. Um, uh, but to rewind a little bit, right before I left, I was talking to Mary Beth on the phone and... Uh, I got off the phone call because I had a phone call with my manager, Kurt. This is right before I go to this Kentucky case. So I hop on the call with Kurt, and I had just told Mary Beth, like, hey, I'll call you back. I got to take this call with Kurt. And the whole time I'm on the phone with Kurt, her phone is just blowing my phone up nonstop. So I finally click over, and I'm like, hey, I will call you back, okay? I'm on the phone with Kurt. And she was like, you are? And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, right now? And I'm like, yeah. It was like she was fucking with me. But she wasn't laughing. She was just saying it. And she's like, okay, call me back. I'm like, okay. And I'm thinking, man, that was weird. It was super weird. So I end up finishing my conversation with Kurt. And I call her back. And I could hear her and her son. And they're in Target. And they were just you know, minutes ago in their car. She's like, how was your call? And I was like, fine. I was like, hey, you know, why, why are you, you know, why did you call me back and blow me up, you know, so, so much? And I'm telling you guys, she had no idea what I was talking about. She was just like, I did not call you, Chad. And she ended up looking at her phone, too, and sent me your call log. And no, the, she had no phone call to me, nothing. Uh, if you know anything about this, this was doppelgangers. It was one of the first time I experienced it, for sure. And I'm telling you, the whole time I was talking to whoever that was that was saying they were her, it was her voice, but something was off. Something I couldn't quite put my finger on. But as I was talking to her, I was like, this is odd. This is her voice? I was like, Maybe the inflections were wrong or something, but something was off, but I was in a hurry, so I didn't... I didn't stop in the moment and go, oh, this is doppelganger. You know, I didn't know. Um, but anyways, that happened right before I went to this Kansas City case. Sorry, not Kansas, Kentucky. I get to this Kentucky case and, um, you know, it's at night. And uh, I check in to my room and everybody's already there. I ended up being the last person to arrive. And right when I walk into my room, my room just feels super creepy. Uh, just dark, just, there was just something about it that didn't feel right. 
Uh, it also seemed very dirty. I was just like, man, did they clean this place? Like, what the hell? And uh, so I remember I texted Ryan. I was like, uh, you know, yo, I'm here. I'm in my, uh, you know, room. Where are you at? You know, like that type of thing. And he texted me back where he was at. Um, but I set my bag down at my bed. And as I set my bag down at my bed, I see this like piece of uh, tissue underneath my bed. And I'm like, oh God, is this something like gnarly, just gross as hell? And I lean down and I look and there must be like, I would say 80 like balled up like tissues where someone had a nosebleed. And it's like they were just wiping the blood and just throwing the tissue under the bed. And whoever cleaned the room did not see it or didn't clean it. But below my bed, there was this just massive amount of blood. I was like, what in the fuck is this? So yeah, I called the front desk and they sent someone up and, and they cleaned all that stuff out. But you know, right away the tone is set and things are just odd. Very odd. So after they get all that stuff cleared out from under my bed, I text Ryan and I say, hey man, um, you know, they got everything cleared out. You want to hang out and talk about the case tomorrow? What's going on? And uh, Ryan says, yeah. So he comes down to my room and we end up talking for probably, geez, two or three hours. And we got into this long conversation, not only about the case, but just about uh, Paranormal State and, uh, you know, how the show could be better, what's great about it, what's lacking about it. Um, and Ryan's asking me, what do you think, you know, is cool about the show and what do you think, basically, what do you think sucks and what do you think could be, you know, what could we do to, to make it just more authentic and make it feel more real? Now, at this point, I've only been on, like, three or four episodes. Uh, I'm still trying to, uh, I guess, kind of get my footing and kind of, you know, make my way into the whole, you know, Paranormal State family. Uh, and believe me, the way to do that is to just show up, do a really good job. Uh, you know, don't bitch about money early. Um, don't make waves. Just bring positivity to the set. It's like any other job that you would work, right? So I wake up the following morning and my phone, my cell phone is just buzzing off the rocker, just buzzing off it like crazy. And I'm like, Jesus, what the hell? And I pick it up and I got a text from this producer that's saying, give him a call. And it's like incessant, you know? So I give him a call and he just starts laying into me, telling me, uh, that this is just bullshit, that, you know, who do I think I am to show up and to tell the star of their show that his show sucks and this is how you would make it better and all this stuff. And I am like, yo, what are you talking about? I'm like, I did nothing of the kind. I'm like, what are you talking about? And they're saying, you know, Ryan already told us everything you said. I'm like, okay, okay, listen. I was like, Ryan asked me in a private conversation what I liked about the show, you know, what I thought we could do better, um, you know, what were strengths and weaknesses. I go, I, I did not show up and say I should direct it and this guy sucks and all this stuff. And we got to a big argument and we ended up working it out and it was like, okay. But as this argument's going on, okay, I start getting these rapid fire texts from Ryan Buell. And I wish Ryan was on this podcast right now to talk about this. This was wild. These texts are coming in on my phone and I got my, uh, the buzzer on the vibrate and each text says 18. I mean, and they are coming like 18, 18, 18. 18. It's like, as I'm on the phone, my phone's just going, bzz, 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 bzz. I mean, probably 25 times. And I'm looking at it as this is happening. And it is really pissing me off. Because I'm thinking, this isn't funny, Ryan. Like, 
this 18 thing is not funny to me at all. Like, you know, it, it is happening around me everywhere. And, you know, <laughs> I know definitely what one interpretation of it is, and it's not good. And so I finally got off the phone with, with uh, this producer, and I just said, listen, I'm going to go talk to Ryan right now and get this straight and just let him know, you know, no one came to me, like, he didn't come to me to say, you know, uh, I'm going to make you director, you know, how are you much better than our current director? Like, that's not how, that's not what occurred. So I go down there to talk with Ryan, and he, you know, lets me in the room. And right away, he's just like, hey, man, that's that's not what I did. I didn't call up and say, you know, you, you know, I basically said that this sucks and you'd do it better and all this stuff. He goes, I just sent him a letter of some thoughts based on our conversations that I thought would be better. Now, I basically learned that actually makes sense because whenever Ryan would say, stuff, say things back in the day, they would always try to find ways to make him look and feel stupid because he was young. Uh, because they're trying to, you know, just have him do whatever he's told. Um, and that just makes the shoots go easier if you don't have an opinion and you just do what, you know, they tell you to do. And I think it's that's the worst way of, uh, you know, of going about making a reality show. And I think Ryan knew that too. Um, but beyond him saying that, what I'm really pissed off about is the 18s. And I'm just telling him, dude, this isn't funny. You know, and he's just like, what are you talking about? And I go, Ryan, just shut up, dude. It's not funny. Don't fuck around with me with this 18 stuff. Like, it's not cool. It's freaking me out. And that just really freaked me out. Now, I could look on his face and see that he's not lying to me. He's not. And so, of course, I check his phone. His phone, uh, yeah, has nothing. It has no outgoing text to me with the number 18. And there was a lot of them, okay? And, and I went to his room, like, seconds after I received the last one because I was in this argument with this producer, and I finished up with him, and my phone was still going off with these 18s, so I just started walking to Ryan's door. I got down to his door, and the last 18 text that I got was right before I got to his door. Now, I just open up his door, and he's on the phone. Like, he's in the mid-conversation with a different... Uh, producer talking about the show and I'm thinking whoa he's just he's he's not he doesn't look like he's texting me he doesn't look like he's messing around with me so yeah like I said you know we go over everything and uh, there are no text from him and he's telling me I didn't do it I didn't do it and then I see something really really bizarre that freaked me out so bad you know, like when you have an iPhone, you get a text, it'll say what time next to it that the text comes in. And, you know, as you get texts throughout the day, it's in the order that you get them, right? So if I am, am texting Joey, if I send Joey a text at noon, and he texts me back, like, three times over the next ten minutes, it'll say, like, the time. Like, it'll be 12.02, then 12.04, and then if he texts a third time, like, 12.08, well, all the 18 texts that I have on my phone, and we documented this, somewhere in <laughs> in my boxes and boxes and boxes of tapes, i got to find this, somewhere I have this documented. And you could see the time is going backwards. It's going backwards. Which is very relevant because in the uh, the world of the demonic, Everything works in reverse. Uh, reverse speech. Uh, time is in reverse. Um, events happen backwards. Uh, people move. Uh, supposedly, or supposedly, in doppelganger, doppelganger cases. God, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time talking right now because this has got me freaked out. Can you tell my blood pressure is up right now? I'm just so geeked out right now. Um, anyways, on doppelganger cases, a lot of times people talk about how um, they'll look across the room and they'll see, like, the person they know talking, but it'll look like they're speaking 
and smiling and, and making all their, their facial expressions. So it'll look like they're doing it in reverse, which is super creepy. Um, so anyways, I'm completely freaked out by this whole uh, scenario. And Ryan is swearing to me, just going, man, it was not me. I didn't do it. I didn't erase any texts. I didn't do anything. I did not text you. But he doesn't got to tell me that anymore. I fully believe him because... Like I said, my texts are going backwards on my phone. Now, I meet with the director that time who's directing everything. And I basically tell him about this. And I'm showing, you know, different crew members. And the crew's freaking out. They're just like, yo, dude, what is going on? And, you know, I basically say to Ryan, well, this is going to be an interesting event because the shit I'm digging into with American Ghost Hunter, this is before... You know, Ryan was completely immersed in AGH. This is when we were just having conversations about it. Um, so Ryan, I think, is starting to catch on that there's something real here that, that's going on with my family. And to, 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 I understand a lot of people come to him and have big cases, uh, uh, big ideas of like, you know, I know this person and it's a demonic case and my home is haunted and it's demonic. So for all he knows... At that time, because we're still getting to know each other, for all he knows at that time, you know, I'm just bullshitting him because I want some kind of TV show or something. I don't think he thinks that, but he, you know, he could have. I mean, we were just getting to know each other. So he's seeing all this, and it's starting to... I could tell it's, it's you know, he has his kind of, uh, you know, his uh, spidey senses, you know what I mean? Like, he's aware that some weird stuff is happening. Uh, between all the blood, you know, things on the, like, for people blowing their nose below my bed, that was just strange. Um, you know, the 18 was strange. The way Rick took his, you know, thoughts and ideas was strange. Um, that morning, there was something else. I forget what it was. There was some, oh, his car for some reason. Um his keys ended up getting locked in his car. Uh, gosh, I wish I could remember the uh, circumstances as to how it happened, but it wasn't anything that that he did. I, I forget the situation. It's so foggy right now, but there was something that was really weird. The whole crew was like, how in the hell did that happen? So they ended up getting his you know keys out of the car. and uh, So we go to this house, and I find out that this is, in fact, a demonic case. And beyond that, and I, I hate when we have cases like this, it's a demonic case with a death that just happened. That there was this demonic spirit, or this demonic entity, this demon that uh, spoke to the sister of the main gal who's living at this house. And the sister woke up in the middle of the night met to this demon in the hallway reportedly and she just got up and walked about a half a mile away and just walked right out into uh, the river. I don't know if it was the Missouri or the Mississippi, but one of them just walked right out into it and drowned. Just committed suicide. Uh, which, you know, suicide is just a, a theme that keeps... Uh, it's a, Suicide is definitely... You know, a portion of the Harbinger story deals with it. Uh, in my family, it's always been something that is um, ever-present, the whole area that I'm from. Um, but also, it just seems like every time I would go and work on a demonic case, every time, guys, somebody there committed suicide recently. In that case, in Kentucky, uh, this... You know, like I said, this girl who's there, her sister, had this encounter, committed suicide. We did another case, a uh, paranormal state, and that was re I just I just directed it. It was where the girl hung herself in the garage, and she had two other sisters. And you know, Ryan felt as though that the the mother uh, had been possessed before, if 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 not still currently. And there was way more to that case too. I'll talk about that at another time. But with this case, right when we show up to the house, I'm completely geeked out, 
um, we're told that there's a son, there's a, a father and a wife, but we're told the son we have to stay away from. I guess he's not going to be involved in this case. And the whole time I'm there, I just keep catching this kid staring at me with a death lock. And not like he's walking by me and looking at me. Like I'll be just standing there like having a cigarette and like looking at the mountains and everything and the hills. And I'm like, you know, just kind of checking out, uh, you know, the yard. And I would just, you know, look over to my right. And he's like 20 feet from me, just dead, just death stare straight at me. Locked on, not saying a word. And I'm just like, okay. Somebody tell me why this kid is looking at me like he wants to rip my throat out. And it just, it was freaky. And I hear the name of the demon supposedly that is visiting or visited the sister was Raum. R-A-U-M. Again, shows up again. I'm just like, oh my God. So what I'm starting to realize is that I think I brought what I was working on kind of to this already trippy case. Um, and I, when I say trippy, it was getting trippier by the, the moment because these demonic cases affect everybody. I remember Chip was acting a little off for him, uh, a little more threatening than usual, a little more, I don't know, just not the same. Initially, Ryan would never freak me out, but when he would get into these cases, he would get... Uh, in deep thought about them all the time. And he took them very seriously with good reason. And he was, yeah, he was affected by everything that was going on uh, to the point where the crew was like literally coming up to me going, hey man, you got to like watch your boy here. He's freaking everybody out. He just has a way about him right now that we're uncomfortable with, you know? And I was like, oh, I, I think he's fine. I mean, he's just, He's in deep thought, but yeah, I mean, he's got a, a lot of weight on his shoulders. This is a lot to process, you know, because again, this mother's sister just committed suicide after meeting this realm in the hallway and, you know, described it in the same exact way, like a bird head with horns. She had walked to the river and just committed suicide and the suicide thing is just really freaks me out because it's so prevalent, guys. It's so prevalent. And the reason that is, is because uh, if you believe in the demonic, and I believe in evil, and to me, if you believe in evil, you believe in the demonic. They're the same thing. You know, one is a little more colorful and has stories associated with it, but what we're talking about is good versus evil. Do you believe in good? Do you believe in love? Uh, you believe in that. I mean, if you believe in that, then you believe in evil. And anyways, yeah, so you know, the sister had just committed suicide, and I'm like freaked out. And uh, I go down in the basement, and Katrina had just got there. And we go down in the basement, and I had just asked, uh, gosh, I think it was one of the producers, what, from their interviews, what had occurred in the basement. And there was this little drum kit. And they said, sometimes they hear the drums playing. And I said to Katrina, I said, yeah, sometimes they hear the drums playing here. So I said in front of Katrina, I said, uh, hey, if you're a, a demon and you're down here, kick the drum, uh, the kick drum. You know, I said, kick this drum on the count of three. And I go, three, two, one, go. Boom, right in front of us. And I, like, stop, and I, like, look back, and I take, like, two or three steps backwards. And Katrina looks at me and goes, wait, what the fuck? And I'm like, yeah. She's like, that just kicked right there, right? I'm like, yeah. She's like, no, that was loud. I'm like, yes, Katrina, yes, that happened. I just, yeah, we both watched it, saw it. Yeah, that was for real. So she's like, we need to tell Ryan. So right away, we're both calling for Ryan to come down and Ryan comes down and again he was in a he was in a weird way he was just acting a little off and because he started doing things like reverse psychology as we're talking to him and telling him about it, he's going no that didn't happen 
That would never happen. There's no way that happened, Chad. And for a few like minutes, I'm looking at Katrina like, what's going on? I'm like, why am I telling Ryan this happened and he's telling me there's no way it happened over and over again and staring at me? I could see on her face, she's kind of like, yeah, this is weird. And then I finally figured out what he was doing. I'm like, oh, oh, he's doing reverse psychology. So he's trying to like doubt me and through the process doubt it, whatever that is. Uh, but again, there's just something kind of off about Ryan during these demonic cases. And uh, he definitely has some kind of, you know, understanding of it or connection to it. But yeah, he was, he was, he was a little off and um, a little odd. Uh, but at the same time, so was Chip. If, and, and, and I don't mean this in like some bad way. Like I'm not condemning him to any, there was just, like I said, there was an aggressiveness to Chip that I had not seen before. And it, it's, at the beginning of the I Am 2 episode, you see a, a small piece of it. Uh, where we're down in the basement and Ryan is talking to Chip about what's down there and what it can do. Basically, he speaks up loud and, and Chip says, he wants me to tell you something, you know, pretty freaky. And Ryan's like, okay, well, tell me then. And Chip says... It wants you to know that it can do whatever it wants to anybody. If it wants to, it could kill somebody. You know, Ryan's like, oh, okay, sure. And Chip goes, it wants me to say that it could kill anybody here. And Chip turns and he's like two inches from my face. And he leans forward really aggressively and he just goes, even you. And he said it in a way that just, they, they edited it out. But I like snapped back. And old Uncle Chip was a second away from just getting dropped. I was gonna, <laughs> I was freaked out, and the way he did it and snapped towards me. I mean, guys, this is not how any of us normally act. Like Ryan uses isn't walking around, really quiet and reserved, and barely speaking to people, and then doing odd behaviors without telling us what his approach is going to be. Chip is not someone that's aggressive. And, like, in your face and you know, trying to freak you out. Like, so, like, everything this morning is just bizarre. Plus, we're having activity, like, left and right, left and right. And, uh, again, I go back up. I'm like, man, this is freaky. I need to get a breath of fresh air. I go outside. I'm, like, standing there just kind of, like, chilling. I walk around the back of the house and no one's there. I'm like, okay, I need to calm down. I turn around to go back in the house. Two feet in front of me, the boy... The boy they're supposed to avoid, he's just staring at me, dead in my eyes, right in front of the door. I'm just sitting here like, okay. Okay, and I'm just like looking at him, just holding, just holding this deadlock stare. And I'm waiting for him to just drop the stare and move out of the way. Which he does not. So I just take a big deep breath and start making my way just to the right side of him so I can get past him. Uh, and I do, which... You know, he breaks eye contact right away once I start moving back around him. Um, and yeah, I mean, at this point, I'm really freaked out. And uh, I started hearing what our plans are that night uh, for the investigation. And I hear we're going to use the Gonsfeld. And at that point, I had real reservations about doing that just because uh, all the weird stuff that's going on, people's personalities, the drum that, that we saw you know, get hit, uh, uh, the bloody nose things below my bed, the 18s on my phone that are going backwards in this demonic language, which is backwards, you know, everything's backwards. And, uh, God, the demonic, uh, the way they operate, the way they speak, think, uh, make predictions, like everything, everything's backwards. Uh, so they say. And also with the demonic, uh, the reason why there's so many suicides associated with the demonic is a lot, of people, a lot of people don't know this. A lot of people don't know this, but that is the goal of the demonic. It is to get you to commit to the biggest blasphemy against God, which is to extinguish life, right? This wonderful, incredible gift that we get. That's what the demonic wants you to do. They want you to kill yourself in ultimate defiance. So after I move around this, this kid... Uh, and I come back up, and the director comes up to me, and he says, 
hey, can you talk to Ryan and make sure he's okay? And I'm like, okay, yeah. And once again, Ryan is, he, he's, he's not doing anything wrong, and he's not doing anything that you would look at him and go, oh, he's crazy or something. There's just a demeanor. It's just a different, it's a quietness, it's a creepiness, it's a darkness. There was just a darkness around him. And I, and I could recognize it. And I remember he, he was just being very short with me, one or two word answers. And I'm walking around with him just trying to, you know, get into his head and make sure he's okay. And being like, yo, dude, like, what's up? You know, talk to me. What's this song about? What's this about? Just trying to have, like, any conversation to try to get him, you know, to relax or anything. And finally, he's, like, super quiet. And he's just standing there. And I look at him and I go, hey, man. You know, you're freaking everybody out. And he's just staring at me. And I'm like, I mean, are you okay, dude? And I go, because, you know, you are being a little different, man. You're being really quiet. You're not really talking to people. And you got a really, like, dark look on your face. You just seem kind of, you know, not all with it, you know. And and he's standing there and he's he's, you know, looking around the place. And he stops and he... He locks eyes with me, and I could tell that his, you know, the the, the brain uh, is just working overdrive, and he's thinking about you know twenty thousand different things at once. You can just tell that he's he has heavy thoughts. He has heavy thoughts, and I just go, hey, well, listen, man, you know, maybe we should just you know call us earlier. Do you want to want to stick this out? I mean, uh, you know, what what what's going on? How are you feeling? Type of thing, and I'll never forget this. We were just standing there. He's quiet, and I'm just kind of staring at Ryan, but he's not saying anything. He's just kind of like standing there. And he quickly leans forward, like, like almost like he's going to headbutt me, but he doesn't. He stops right in front of me, and he kind of cocks his head a little bit so that he's whispering to me. Very quietly, he just says to me, This motherfucker is coming to get me. And steps back and looks at me. And again, this was no game. He was dead serious. And he felt like whatever was there, or at least an entity that he had come across before, um, you know, was somehow involved with him. And I can understand it because I had things going on that I felt like I definitely brought with me. Um, or at least we're triggering similar things, uh, you know, in this in this case. Well, that night, I end, I end up getting stuck in the one room that's at the end of the hallway that the sister saw this realm. And uh, there was, man, I, I, I maybe got in 10 minutes of investigating before everything went sideways. And when I was in that bedroom, there was things going off left and right, knocking left and right. I mean, there's a lot of stuff happening, and uh, it was freaking me out. Um, but I'll never forget this. Ryan and Chip begin doing the Gonsfeld, and Ryan's asking Chip the questions. And I was sitting literally six inches behind where the main camera is, just because I wanted to see what was going on. And I thought something big is going to happen. The whole time I was going, man, something major is going to happen tonight. And, uh, yeah, I'll never forget it. All of a sudden, you just hear Chip going, Ryan, it's Laura. Uh, she needs you. And, and I'm telling you, the second Chip said that, the second he said that, Ryan's phone, which was right in front of me, lit up, and it was Laura's mom leaving Ryan a message saying that if we don't get up there, Laura is going to die. That's what her mom said. Basically, she was afraid of her dying. So at this point, it's now very, very heavy. Uh, to make a long story short, Ryan decides we're going to IM6. And uh, that just, you know, it is what it is. Massive fight between production and Ryan. I thought he really held his ground well. Basically, just told them, well, I'm going so you can document me or not, because that's what you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be a documentary film crew documenting our lives, and I'm going to this. So that was wild just to, to go up there. Um, now, if I'm correct, I think Father Bob stayed behind with directives 
of what to do with the family. But I just remember we decided we were going to go, or Ryan did, and we decided, you know, we could uh, join him because at that time they had to find money to go do it because that was an extra episode. It wasn't the budget. So production's kind of freaking out because they have half of one episode where things are incredibly strange and there's all kinds of weird stuff happening, but none of it they can really use because like the whole 18s and all the stuff that's going on with me, there's no backstory with this. It's like they're still making a TV show. There's no way for them to explain all of the weird stuff that we were experiencing personally and why it would connect and matter. Like why would realm at that time be such you know an important name in my life well it mattered to me because of the history the history in my house uh the photo of this what looked like a you know the description of realm outside the window uh you know in my house in persia um you know the suicides i had lost so many friends to suicide you know, even back then, the numbers were just rocking, man. They were just nonstop. And, uh, you know, here we are, another case where, you know, a girl meets, uh, you know, this demon that, uh, you know, has an effect on her. And shortly later, she walks right into, you know, a river and drowns herself. I was just seeing it left and right, you know, all these demonic cases. I was seeing it. And that was the fear of Laura Mooney's mother. You know, she kept saying, Ryan, you got to get up. And she was leaving these blood-curdling messages. I mean, you should have heard these messages, guys. They were so freaky. And she was saying, if you don't come here, I don't know that Laura's going to make it to the night. I think, I think it's going to kill her uh, or basically convince her to do self-harm. I mean, it was, it was wild, you know? I mean, it was the first time that I had to consider that the demonic may be very real and may have these types, uh, this type of effect on people, the spirit influence, and maybe it could provide, uh, you know, the the push or just the nudge. So, anyways, um, you know, we go to I am six. You guys saw Ryan and I arrived there first. That's when I went down to the basement. That's when I got attacked down there. Um, I wasn't surprised that it happened because, again, we just came off an incredibly hot case with all kinds of weird stuff happening, left and right, um, people acting strange. Uh, the whole place was acting strange. I remember leaving. We left Kentucky. That kid stared me dead in the eyes. Uh, from the moment I, I walked in, every time I would get a, a shot of him, I would look over and he'd be staring directly at me. And when I left, he was staring at me the entire way down this long-ass driveway, and it freaked me out. I'm like, why is this kid locked on me? Uh, it was a trip. But So we had this footage there, but there was no resolve because we all left. And a &E just didn't know what to do with this footage. He had no resolve in the case and no way to really line up. Why is this happening to so many people? Which, in retrospect, again, I believe it was happening because we were all just immersed in the demonic. I mean, I was working on it full-time with my family's case, plus Paranormal State. Uh, Ryan was working on the case that we were on, plus Laura Mooney, uh, plus other demonic cases. I mean, we were just, that was the world we were in. And that's why those things were happening, just... Hold on just a second, guys.
So, I just learned that my my cousin committed suicide. Um, I just learned about this, so I'm just going to wrap this up. And, yeah. I don't want to say much more, just because it's, it's family. They haven't spoken about it publicly yet, I'm sure. But, yeah. I will... Talk to you guys soon. Bye.